Good morning, and welcome back to this week's Word. I'm Pastor Jody, First Baptist Church here in Kaiser, West Virginia. So as promised, we're going to continue on this week in the book of Revelation chapter 1. Last week, we looked at the first three verses. This week, we'll be at verses 4 through 8. And this is a very exciting section that we're going to be talking about today. It's all exciting, but this one is very exciting because of of verse 7, I believe. It says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Does that get you just a little bit giddy when you read that verse, that Christ is coming and every eye will see him? Now, we know that Christ one day soon is going to step out from the clouds and he's going to shout with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ, the dead in Christ will be raised up and be brought into his presence. Then those of us who will remain on the earth shall be caught up after that. So not every eye will see Christ at the rapture of the church. But here in verse 7, it says, Behold, every eye will see him. Because when he comes, he's coming as judge. He's coming to set up his kingdom. So we're talking about the second coming of Christ today in this section. And I believe we're not too far away from this day taking place. Behold, Christ is coming. Your Redeemer is coming. The lover of your soul is coming. And he's going to set up his kingdom. I can't wait for this day. And I pray that you are so excited about what God is about to do. So let's begin as we start in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. I want to read verse 4 and the first part of verse 5. It says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. May the Lord add a blessing in the reading of his word here this morning. So I want you to pay close attention to these verses that I read here this morning, because verse 4 mentions the number 7 twice, and we're going to see it multiple times as we come through uh, prayerfully, more of the book of Revelation. Maybe we'll get into uh, two or three chapters, maybe even further than that. Whatever the Lord wills, we're going to continue on this journey until the Lord leads us somewhere else. But the Lord here uses the number seven. And I believe he's doing that here in the book of Revelation to once again show us and prove to us that the number seven represents completeness. You know, there's seven days in the week. There are multiple things that happen throughout the Old Testament around the seventh day. And I want to discuss just a few of those. I'm going to give you several scriptures here in just a minute. I'm not going to read all these scriptures, but I'm going to, I want to give the reference to you, and you can write them down, and that way you can go back and, and check it out for yourself. Just don't trust what I'm telling you. Get in God's Word and find out for yourself what the Word of God says. We don't ever want to go according to man but according to the word of God. And so I want to encourage you as I give a scripture, you follow along, you go back maybe in in a little while and read those scriptures to prove what I'm telling you, to prove what I'm saying to you is correct. It says in God's word in first, uh, first John, I believe it's chapter four, that we are to test every spirit to see whether it's of God or not. And so even me, test me, prove what I'm saying by the word of God. So again, back to the number seven. First, we're told that John is to address the seven churches that are in Asia, which that is modern day Turkey. So John had seven churches. We know that he was the pastor of the church there at Ephesus. And so there were seven churches in that region that I believe John had charge of. And now the Lord is telling him to write letters to these seven churches and chapter two and chapter three is the proof of those letters. And maybe we'll talk about that in a few weeks. So John's instructed to to address the seven churches, and also we're told that there are seven spirits who are before his throne. Again, God is using the number seven, and John is putting this to paper to show us that it represents completeness. You know, I think we're going to see that number seven all throughout the book of Revelation, and I think we're going to see it because... It's the last book of the Bible, and it's going to show us that it is the it is the complete story of things that will take place. So I just want to give you a few examples from the number seven. As I said, you know, there are seven days in a week. God used that um, number seven to show the completeness of many different things. 
So if you think about the Old Testament, you'll see that the Sabbath, circumcision, and worship all hinged all around the seventh day. These things all took place on the seventh day. In Joshua chapter 6, we see that the children of Israel were instructed to march around the city of Jericho seven times. And you know what happened? The seventh time as they as they marched around and they blew their trumpets, the walls of the city fell. And they were able to go in and take the city. In 2 Kings chapter 5, we see a great warrior by the name of Naaman. And he was stricken with leprosy. And leprosy was a death sentence. He would be you know, cast away from people and he would live out the rest of his days alone. And so Naaman was in dire need of a healing. So he was instructed to go and wash seven times in the Jordan. And if he would be, be faithful to the word of God and, and bathe himself in the Jordan seven, seven times, he would be healed of his leprosy. Guess what? Naaman bathed himself in the in the Jordan seven times, and on the, upon that seventh time, he was healed of his leprosy. In Genesis chapter 41, we see in the days of Joseph, when he was a slave there in Egypt, God told him that there would be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. Because jo Joseph obeyed the word of the Lord, and he knew that there would be seven years of plenty, he stored up. He stored up all the storehouses there in Egypt. And when those seven years of famine came, he was able to provide not only, only for the king's house, but for all the people in the land, even his own family. So again, God uses that number seven. In Daniel chapter four, we see Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar having a very close relationship. And God given Nebuchadnezzar these dreams. And the last dream that Daniel had to interpret for King Nebuchadnezzar was that he was going to be driven mad. He was going to go insane. But on the seventh year, he would be restored. And as Nebuchadnezzar was up uh, one night looking over the kingdom, pride entered his heart. And he said, look at this city that I have built. He gave no glory to God. At that moment, he lost his mind. He was driven completely mad. He went out into the field and he lived out in the field until he looked like an animal. You know, his hair grew out long, his fingernails and toenails got really long and he began to resemble a beast and he ate the grass in the field. That was his, that was his food. And so he was acting kind of like a, a cow. But on that seventh year, God restores him. Again, the number seven. God brings completeness. In Matthew chapter 13, the Lord Jesus Christ himself gives us seven different parables that we might be encouraged and see how we are to live our lives. In the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have the complete story of the cross of Jesus Christ. And, during, and as we read those four gospels, four different gospels, we get the seven sayings of Jesus Christ. Christ spoke seven times from the cross. Seven different times Christ spoke from the cross. The last thing that he spoke from the cross, it is finished. The seventh thing he spoke, it is finished. The completeness of the cross. And now here in Revelation, we'll see that number seven being used multiple times, proving that it is God's number of, per, of completeness. So the book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible. And all things will be completed by Jesus Christ, who is that faithful witness, as it says at the end of verse 4. I'm sorry, the beginning of verse 5. He's that faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth. Let's go on and read verse, uh, the second part of verse 5 and verse 6. It says, To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What an awesome couple of verses this is. We're redeemed by no one other than Jesus Christ. He washed us by his blood and brought us into the family of God. Listen to Romans chapter 8. I want to read verse 16 and 17. It says this in, in verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. 
that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. First Peter chapter two, verse nine says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So we've been adopted into royalty. Peter tells the apostle, Peter tells us that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And we weren't always a perfect people because he says he called us out of darkness and brought and brought us and brings us into his marvelous light. That's what adoption looks like. We, you know, somebody who takes a child from potentially a, a bad situation and brings them, them into a much better situation. That's what God has done for us. We were born into this dark and dying world, but through salvation, through the bloodshed of Jesus Christ, we're brought in to his presence. That's what it says here to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Christ has cleansed us through the blood of his son and our savior, Jesus Christ. Have you given him glory lately? Have you praised the name of your savior? Have you thanked God the father for sending forth his son? That the penalty for our sins was paid for. And he has made us clean. If we confess our sins. First John 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins, he's faithful, he's just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what the Lord has done for us. We are royalty. We're a part of the family of God as believers. And we have a hope. And it's found in verse 7. It says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 says, Behold, he is coming. And not only that he's coming, this is the second coming of Christ, but every eye will see him this time. You see, not every eye will see him when he steps out from the clouds. When he comes for his bride, when he comes for his church, not every eye will see him. Only those that belong to Christ. Only those that have their lamps full of oil and their wicks are trimmed. Repre you know, these represent the true church of God. Only they will be the ones who see him at that time. But when Christ comes to earth, all the, all the earth will see him. All the earth will see him. And it says here in Scripture, even those that pierced him. And who are the ones that pierced him? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, my sins and your sins have pierced him. He died for those sins. So we can talk about those who pierced him as the ones being present at the cross that day. And literally are the ones who drove the nails into his hands or stuck the, the spear into his side. We can say those are the ones who pierced him. No, that's not true. Your sins, my sins have pierced him. It wasn't those nails that held him to the cross. It wasn't any rope. It was our, it was, it was, it was our sins that put him on that cross. And it was his love that held him there. He died for the sins of the world that we might have life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Behold, he is coming, and every eye will see him. It says in Scripture that every eye will see him, and, and every person, every tribe will mourn for him. I believe the believers at that time will weep because they're going to see their Savior face to face. I believe an un... an unconvinced world uh, non-believers will mourn because they missed their opportunity. And they know what judgment is coming. Go away from me, for I never knew you. Therefore, they will mourn. So there'll be a lot of tears that day. Tears of joy for the believers. Tears of sadness for those who have not believed. 
The last verse, verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. It all began with the Lord and it will all end with him as well. Seven is the number of completeness. I, play, I pray that your life is being completed because you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you're ready for the day that he steps out from the clouds and you will see him face to face. Thanks for joining me. I pray that you have a blessed, wonderful week in the Lord.